The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Putting down roots in a place doesn't instantly make it home. That requires more, as writer Elamine Abdul Mahmoud makes clear in his lovely new memoir, Son of Elsewhere. He's with us tonight to explain. Then, picking up on the new TVO original documentary series, Crossroads Beyond Boom and Bust, that had its world broadcast premiere earlier this evening, we're asking, how can so-called one industry towns in Ontario thrive again after the main employer pulls up stakes? It's Monday, June 13th, and that's next on The Agenda. Place and belonging are complicated things. Hugely so for, say, a kid from the capital of Sudan on the banks of the Nile who found himself on the shores of the St. Lawrence, walking the limestone streets of Kingston, Ontario. Elamine Abdul Mahmoud is a culture writer at BuzzFeed News and a commentator on CBC. But it is his new book, Son of Elsewhere, a memoir in pieces that will have people talking this year. It is his story and a rare meditation on the experience of coming to Canada. And we're delighted that it brings Elamine Abdul Mahmoud back to this studio. Hey. Hi. Can I start by just telling you how utterly disappointed I was in this book? Because <laughs> there's not a word in here yeah. about the fact that you worked at TVO and yeah. we made you the success you are today. I'm so sorry. I should have paid more penance, more credit. You know, I more, apologize. More, is... more due diligence yeah. to the fact that it all began here. Yeah. Pass my apologies to Stacy, that's my bad, you know. <laughs> Sheldon, who's in charge of here? I like someone should be apologizing. Should have a whole board of apologies right now. I agree, I agree. Good, okay, yeah. we got that out of the way. Yeah. Elamine, let's start from the beginning. Let's How does do a it. nice 12-year-old kid come from Khartoum, Sudan to Kingston, Ontario, Canada? Well, that was not a decision that was in my hands, right? So I didn't make that call. I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like, hey, the city that we choose is Kingston. My dad chose Kingston. So my dad um, left Sudan uh, five years before we did, before me and my mother did. Um, and he came to Canada. He came to Canada and he chose to settle down in Kingston, Ontario. Actually, originally he chose to settle down in Toronto. Um, and then after visiting a friend, he sort of felt that Kingston was a little bit safer. Um, and then we joined him five years later. So I came to this country in the year 2000. Uh, I didn't know any, any English whatsoever. Um, and I came and I thought, okay, so this is, this is a new home. Let's get to know it. That's amazing to me that you spoke no English at all. Yeah. Because, of course, you make your living right now speaking and writing very good English. How well, did you learn English? Uh, through being in Kingston. I mean, like, there's one way to, you know, one way to teach someone any kind of skill is to just throw them in the pool and be like, let's see what happens. You might drown, hopefully not. You'll probably have to learn to swim. And I think that was... The circumstance that happened here is not only did I learn English, I learned very specific, like, Kingston English. And I'm actually very aware of this now when I talk to other people who are like, hey, you definitely have an accent. And I say, no, I don't. Um, and it's because I have this sort of, you know, southeastern Ontario accent, this way of speaking um, that is familiar to you and me, but, you know, everywhere else in the country, it's very different. Why did your dad want to leave in the first place? leave Sudan. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so he went through quite a bit of government pressure um, after the Bashir government came um, into power. My dad ran a publishing company um, in Sudan. Um, one of the things that they published is this uh, magazine that was the official magazine of the opposition at a time when all the opposition parties were exiled. Uh, it's a brave thing for him to do, but also at a certain point, um, the government came to our house and they said, you're going to stop running your operation now. Uh, they took his truck basically overnight. Um, and he decided, you know what, that's not the place where I want to raise a family. Um, and so that's when he decided to leave. First, he went to Switzerland, and then he came to Canada. Why did you all not leave together? Why did he come first? I think the thought was, go somewhere. I mean, this, this is sort of a very typical immigrant story of, you know, go to a new place, find an apartment, find a job, settle down, um, and then apply to bring the rest of the family with you. That sort of is, that's, makes the process much easier. Um, and also, while you're going through the process of saying, hey, I'm a refugee, I'm a political refugee who's escaped from this country, um, it's just a little bit easier to address one person as opposed to a whole family. So, you know, th that is, I mean, when I read the book, that yeah. is one of the things that is so resonant because, yeah. I mean, I have two great grandfathers who did the the exact same thing. Yes. One leaving from Ukraine to London, Ontario, sending for his family 10 years later. 10 so years. This is a very, very familiar story it's a to so many story. people. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Can I have you, we don't usually do this, but yeah. you are here in the yeah. studio. I'm here. Which is a wonderful thing after two years. We don't normally have guests in the studio. 
Read the prologue, if you would. I would love to. Okay. Thank you for having me read. Not at all. Who wrote this? Was it me? Okay. Yes, sir. All right, all right, let's do this. <laughs> Elsewhere, I'm a student of migration stories. I am pulled toward accounts of lives rearranged by the journey from one place to another. If you tell me you are an immigrant or a child of immigrants, we're going to spend some time together because I will want to hear of the ways you've had to stretch yourself to find your footing. Your story might include yearning for a home you haven't seen in some time, if ever. It might also feature the hard work of adjusting to new expectations. But neither the yearning nor the adjusting are the point. Instead, I'm interested in the constant calculus of how much of yourself to a lot to each homeland and how you navigate the anguish that comes with giving one of them less. This is elsewhere. What's, what's one of the things that's so remarkable about the book is how you really, and in my culture we'd say, you put your kishkas right on the table. <laughs> like it's all out there. Yes. And I wanna know how you felt comfortable enough to reveal so much about okay. all of this Sturm und Drang that's going on inside you. I'm learning a whole set of new words today. That's what <laughs> I'm learning. Um, you know what, honestly, part of it is the, the deceptive the, 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 the deceptive privacy of the writing process, right? When you're in front of the keyboard, it's just you and the computer, right? There's not this whole thing. I don't imagine going to talk to Steve Pakin about it on the agenda. Like, that was not a part of the, the process. So I don't think I imagined an audience for some time while I was writing this. For me, it was really, like, drag myself up to the keyboard, try to get these thoughts as accurately and honestly and, and, and sort of emotionally as possible. Okay, but you've done that. Yeah. But now, yeah. now there's a lot of people who know so yeah. much more about you than you do about them. And I continue to be shocked about it every day. I mean, like, sometimes someone will bring up something from the book and I'll say, hey, how do you know that? And they'll say, you wrote it in a book. I'm like, I'm, I'm learning. I'm, this is not, all a part of it. Is there not a part of you that thinks, oh my God, there's lots of people out there who know a lot of very deeply personal stuff about me and, and actually on second thought, I'm not that comfortable with all that. Well, listen, so far the book has been out for a few weeks. Um, nobody's weaponized any of those things. <laughs> Instead, most people have come up and said, you know what, that made me feel really seen. That really resonated with me. That sort of made me understand my parents a little bit better. So it's been very nice story. So as much as it's been people bringing up things from the book that I was like, oh, wow, that's a really a thing that happened. Um, and they want to talk about it, and I feel so exposed. Um, they also follow that up by saying, you know what, and I also I really appreciated it because it added something to my life. And nice. so, listen, in a year from now, if somebody's trying to bring up some things from the book, trying to make me feel awful about it, we'll see the conversation again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. You've got this interesting push and pull with your parents throughout the book as they yeah. try to, to keep you with a foot in where you're from originally, sure. and you're trying to sort of have another foot very deeply planted in where you are right now. Yeah. How did you negotiate all of that with your folks as you're a young kid growing up? I would say not well. That's the chief description of how I negotiated that. But at the time, I don't think I recognized what they were trying to do, which is, you know, sort of trying to prepare me for life in Canada while also recognizing that they're a little bit afraid because they don't know. A little bit afraid? Well, they're quite father, a bit afraid. Your father says to you, if you don't pick your grades up, I'm sending you back to Sudan. His favorite threat back at the time. <laughs> you know what? He didn't follow through on it, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but, but I think, like... The emotion behind that is something that didn't register with me at the time, which is that they were very wary of what life would be like here. You know, what are Canadian friends going to be like? Um, what's the school going to be like? So they were always like, you know, you got to come home by like 8 or 9 p.m. and like the, we're going to bed. Like there's no, you strict know, there's home. no. Yeah, very strict. Um, and at the time, it only filled me with angst. And I turned to, you know, new metal music. I listened to a lot of Linkin Park, a lot of sad music that I was like, oh, my parents are very angry with me. And it felt very resonant, very helpful um, for me in terms of getting through that period of time. Um, and it's only now that I can look back with uh, a great deal of empathy of saying, oh, wow, you're going through a lot. That's why you were sort of trying to put those limitations on, on the situation, because for you, you just didn't know what to expect about what your son was doing when he was out there. And now that you're a parent, maybe you have yeah. more empathy for the decisions they had to confront? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, go. yes, I, it fills me with dread to think about it, but I'm like, oh, yeah, I think I might have done some of the same things if right. I was in your position. Okay, let's get into some of the heavy-duty stuff here, shall let's we? Let's do it. You write, it took two stopovers and 19 hours of flying time for me to become black. Yeah. 
What does that mean? That means that uh, I grew up in a world, I grew up in a country where everyone, most people, shared my skin color. We didn't have to think about our skin color as particularly meaningful at all. And then I kind of come here, and then there's attached meaning and context and history um, to my skin color. There are black Canadians, and there's like a whole history to learn of what it means to be a black Canadian. Uh, you have a picture of Lincoln Alexander right over there on your set. Like, that's not a name that I was particularly familiar with. There is, I think, when you, when you are a black person who comes from a different land, to North America, there is maybe um, an inheritance of, uh, of a black history that you're not quite familiar with. And so for me, um, I, I came here and then suddenly my skin color had a different context and I had to get very familiar with that context quickly. And you know, a cousin of mine was sort of trying to guide me through this process and she was like, look, it's really gonna help if you start listening to hip hop. But I grew up in a pretty conservative Muslim um, Sudanese household, and so a lot of the themes of hip hop, especially in the early 2000s, made me run away, made me recoil. I was like, I'm not ready for this, which is why I think I spent a bit of time rejecting blackness at the time. Do you think if you had not come to Kingston, but rather to, let's say, Brampton or Mississauga, it sure. might have been different? Not only do I think it would be different, I think about that all the time. I think in entirely about that sliding doors moment of, you know, the Kingston outcome versus the Toronto outcome. If my dad had just chosen to stay in Toronto, um, I think I'd end up in entirely, first of all, I think I would speak English in a slightly different way because I would have grown up around a, a lot of other folks um, who would speak it with an accent that is different than the sort of Kingston accent that I grew up with. And I think that would have, you know, impacted my life in a very different way than the one that ended up happening. Um, but then also, just in terms of community, in terms of my relationship to blackness, I think I would have, you know, grown up quite different. How did you say the letter H? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I said etch. I, that was sort of how I learned that letter. I said etch, etch. And, yeah. then, and then someone made fun of me, and it, was, it felt awful, you know? Did yeah. you have moments where you confronted your parents and say, I wish you'd never left Sudan in the first place? No. No, I didn't have that particular moment. I think, like, maybe my parents had moments of, oh, are we sure about this? Are we sure about this thing that we're doing here? Um, but I didn't have that moment because I kind of had a thirst to get to know this new place that we're in. And I think it probably helped a lot that my parents were trying to pull me away from it because then it made me sort of run towards it a little bit more. Because that's how parenting works sometimes. You know, you, you, you have, by Kingston, Ontario standards, yeah. a rather... Um, different name, let's put it that way. Sure. A somewhat exotic name. What, what a way to put it. For Kingston, Ontario. Yes. So you called yourself Stan the Microphone Man. I did. And here we go. This is you from the book. So Stan, the kid who listened to Linkin Park and watched wrestling, couldn't choose not to be read as at least a little black. This came out in throwaway comments from white friends like, well, you're black, but you're not really black. The implication here was, I recognize that your skin color is dark, but you are not exhibiting the other symptoms I associate with blackness. Sure. Okay, did that offend you when you heard that kind of stuff? No, I don't think so. I think I actually took pride in it at the time because this was a period of time where I was running away from the idea of blackness. I was um, spending quite a bit of time rejecting being associated with blackness in Canada. And so for me, um, when they said stuff like this, I was like, it's working. I'm, you know, I'm convincing them in a way that my blackness is not a particularly important fact about me. Um, so it's you're happy being an Oreo? I, that's, I think, I, listen, if you look at the 2005 Bay Ridge Secondary School yearbook, it says that my, you know, my, my real name is Stan the Microphone Man, but one of the, my other nicknames is Oreo. Like, I sort of proudly um, declare that was one of my um, identities. Just I, for those who don't know, black on the outside, sure. white on the inside, but Oreos. Then, but then I sort of come back to that now, and I look at it with a, with a, with a combination of cringing deeply internally, but also a fair bit of sympathy and empathy for that kid who just sort of needed to get through high school and was like, if this is what's going to get you through high school, man, why not, you know? A black journalist once told you you needed to make more enemies. Yeah. The suggestion being that you fear making people uncomfortable because you don't want to risk, you know, what, what is a pretty nice place you have in society right now. You sure. work for a good news organization. Yeah. You're an author now. You get on TV a lot. Mm -hmm. Is there truth to that accusation? 
Probably, probably more truth than I'd like to admit to myself. You know, that's one of the things, that's one of the chapters that I uh, very, um, how, how, how do I say this, cowardly sort of left open-ended in terms of saying, I have some thinking to do about this. But I think it's true in the sense that, you know, if there was a, ever an imagined audience for this book, it was an imagined audience of, you know, Kingstonians, people that I grew up around trying to not to ruffle their feathers too much. And I think I'm still trying not to make too many enemies in that regard. What is this on the cover? This is the Highway 401. This is the 401, yeah. or better known, I shouldn't say better known, but yeah. originally known yeah. as the McDonald Kershey Freeway. Yeah, that's right, the name that nobody uses, but that's yes, right. absolutely, 100%. Um, the 401 is almost a character in itself yeah. in this book. Yeah. What, uh, why is it so important that it merits being on the cover of the book? I, uh, I say in the book that uh, the 401 was the first friend I ever made in Canada. And it's because, you know, as I was coming out of Pearson and on my way to Kingston, this was my first impression of this land. This is the first time that I was sort of shell-shocked to learn that suddenly my dad speaks English, you know, which had not really occurred to me or had not seen it in practice. But I remember him pulling off into an exit into to the Tim Hortons, uh, like, which is like truly, you know, people put this in Tim Hortons commercials, you know. Um, but it is that moment where my dad goes up to the counter and he speaks in English and he orders a double double and I go what <laughs> you speak English now and of course he had for years um, but this all of these mo emotions were processed on the 401 and then after that drives to Kingston um, happened um, where I sort of would have confrontations or difficult moments with my parents um, and then I would drive on the 401 again and I sort of try to process those emotions so for me the 401 is a place of a lot of tears a lot of um, thinking a lot of growth a lot of contemplation um, of my relationship with my parents um, the 401 is the longest essay in the book but it's also about my parents essentially but the ways that our relationship has changed over the years as lovely as that iconic Tim Hortons moment is yeah you've also no doubt had your share of the other side of being a person with dark skin in this country which is to say after 9-11 there were mm -hmm. some uncomfortable things said mm -hmm. about people with Arabic sounding names sure. uh, I don't have to tell you there are there are frequent moments throughout the course of the last 20 years in particular where, where anti-Muslim Islamophobia is yeah. a thing in this country. Of course. How have you negotiated your way around all of that? I'm, I'm not sure particularly elegantly, to be honest with you. And by that, I mean, like, I think I have a complicated relationship with my faith in the sense that I, with a name like Abdul Mahmoud, um, with the sort of the work that I do, I get to be a little bit more visible than I would like to imagine myself being. And part of that, you know, for example, um, there was a YouTuber who made this like 30 minute, 40 minute video, um, patiently demonstrating how I'm a Muslim sleeper agent. And um, I'm, I'm sort of, and she basically took clips of me appearing on different panels and paused it and I treated it as like a play-by-play -play and she'll say like see here he's trying to seed his little Muslim ideas into the minds of the presenters and I actually like return back to that video and not because I'm upset about it but actually because I'm like I wish I was a sleeper agent because I would <laughs> at least imply it to a certain level that I was like pretty good at dedicating myself to my faith but if <laughs> I was a sleeper agent no one has used the wake word like I don't know you know to what extent I'm a sleeper agent and so um, I feel quite a bit of complication about the fact that I'm a very visible Muslim because I'm like am I a very good representation of that I'm not sure that I am how much racist slash hate mail do you get because you are a fairly visible out there person it's i mean it's it's part of the it's part of the tapestry at this point it's part of the tapestry of the job at this point like do you get something every day i don't know about every day probably every week every know? week yeah and how does it come into you uh sometimes email sometimes twitter dms sometimes just a random tweet from a person hmm. yeah does it hurt you no um it frustrates me but i'm not sure it hurts me and i think by the distinction I mean, you know, sometimes I'm like, I wish I could engage with this person, but they're not really here to sort of, you know, have a conversation about um, the words that they just use to describe me. They're only here to just throw a dagger and then leave. Um, and I'm like, I don't know, let's, let's have a chat about this. Cause I always want to like understand mm -hmm. those people. I say, okay, what forced you in between all of life's, you know, complications? Like you have to worry about, I don't know, COVID-19 and the bills you have to pay and getting to work on time, 
getting back home on time, but you're like, no, 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 let me carve out <laughs> five minutes of my time to send a little bit of hate mail. That's fascinating to me. Like, I want to, I want to ask that person questions, um, but I can't, um, and so, and so I don't. Um, and so, I'm not sure that it hurts me anymore. I think the first few is like, oh, this, this is really deeply wounding. Um, but I think there's also a cost to treating it as an anthropolo anthropological kind of experiment. I think there's sort of something breaks in you where you kind of go like, oh, I got to depersonalize this. I got to make sure that, you know, in my mind, this isn't about me. This is about some kind of idea that they have of me. Because um, I think if I let it be about me, then maybe it would hurt a little bit more. Some of the sweetest parts of the book yeah. are you describing yourself falling in love with a young woman named Emily. Yeah. Who went on to become your wife. Yes. Okay, here we go. What color is Emily? She's a white woman. Yeah. And how did that go over in your parents' household? Well, at first, not well. At first, not particularly well. Um, my mom eventually sort of came to embrace her uh, early. Um, and my dad took him probably about three, four years of us being married before he sort of came, or he came back around. But he, my, my old father was not at the wedding, um, which is, you know, one of the painful moments in this book. And we sort of talked a lot about um, the apology that my dad made, because I think he made one of the best apologies in the known universe um, for the pain that he caused before that. And he sort of sat me down and he apologized and he then apologized again to Emily for that. Um, but that's a, you know, that's something that we did in fact go through, you know? That is a lovely part of the book. Now, did he not want you to marry her because she was white? I'm not sure that my dad was being racist in that moment so much as he was being um, resistant to... It wasn't anything that had to do with her skin color, I don't think, or even anything to do with um, with her faith or lack thereof, because like she's not a Muslim woman. Um, I think it had to do with his representation of that, or like rather his idea of, okay, my son, in my mind, he's going to marry a Muslim woman. This is not happening. So, like, it's like more of the story that she, part of... The, how do I put this? More of the part that she fills in the story than it is about her specifically, mm. if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is why when he kind of came back around, it was so much of an apology of like, oh, I didn't get a chance to get to know you. You didn't get a chance to get to know, you know, the kind of joy that you guys have together. And then like, I'm very grateful that he's a part of that now. How does a son react when his mother says to him, you are no longer my son and I never want to speak to you again? Uh, not well. Um, I remember very tearfully sort of carrying my suitcase across um, a parking lot because um, it's, it's part of the story. is like I had to go to a friend's wedding because my parents were very sure that uh, I was in fact not going to do that, but I was going to visit um, Emily. Um, and as a result, um, my mom said, okay, you're no longer my son, you're leaving this house. And I remember sort of dragging my suitcase across, um, very, uh, very upset, very emotional. And then, you know, two days later after I returned from this friend's wedding, my mom calls me, she says, hey, why haven't you called me? And I was like, I <laughs> thought I was no longer your son. And I knew from that moment that we would be just fine. That is such a mother thing to do, if yeah, I may say. I could say good. I'm not a mother, but, sure. um, you know, to say, I never want to see you again, I never want to speak to you again, and then two days later say, why didn't you call me? Yeah, it was very sweet. It was, it was like, honestly, like the minute that she called me two <laughs> days later, um, and it was just like, just out of concern, like, hey, you haven't called. I was like, oh, we're going to be fine. Like, we'll, it'll take us a period of time to get through this, but we'll get there. Why do you think things were as stormy as they were with your parents for as long as they were? Um, probably a language is a part of that just in terms of being able to communicate. I think like when I communicate in Arabic, I'm frozen in time as a 12 year old. Mm. I am adolescent, I'm pleading, I'm asking for permission. I don't know if I can communicate, you know, how to be a full adult in Arabic. And so as a result, like I really struggle with that. I really struggle with communicating to them like, hey, here's my boundary, here's my need, and here's the thing that I'm going to do because it fills me with this kind of joy. Mm. Um, and so, I think I was asking for permission for too long as opposed to sort of trying to come to an understanding of like, here's where I am, where are you guys at with this? And like, let's figure our way through this. What have you learned from the example that they'd set parenting that you either do or do not want to do now that you are a parent? I think I'm exactly as stubborn as my parents are. Um, and it's kind of coming out in my relationship with my daughter, who's five. And I've sort of been noticing lately that like every time that I'm stubborn with her, she's like, oh, I'll be stubborn right back. And then we have a stubbornness sort of arms race. And uh, she's learning like, hey, the, the solution to dealing with a stubborn person is just to out stubborn them <laughs> and this will never end. And so I'm trying to de-escalate myself in order for her to learn to be like, okay, I don't need to sort of escalate to 11. It's great. Having a five-year-old, it's a, it's a joyful time. You've done this a few times. I have. Yeah. What does she call you? Uh, she calls me Baba, just like I call my dad. 
Yeah. That's sweet, eh? It you is. You gotta like that. Yeah, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the dedication at the start of your book. It yeah. says, for my parents, whose dreams I carry, yeah. for Emily, who lights my way home, for Amna, for your elsewhere. Yeah. What does all that mean? I think the idea was to understand that one day my daughter will try to figure out and negotiate her relationship with a bunch of different homelands. You can sort of start to see this happening as she asks me more questions about Sudan. She's like, wait, wait, they're, up, they're probably pretty upset that you left, aren't they? You know, um, why do they ask so many questions about me? And she, you could sort of try to see that she's trying to figure out how much of herself to give to Sudan and how much of her belongs here. Um, not to, you know, ascribe too much um, intentionality to a five-year-old's questioning, but that's sort of my interpretation of those questions. Um, and my guess is at a certain point, um, she's going to have, have to navigate her own elsewhere, her own idea of being suspended between a couple of places where she's from. And, and hopefully this book will be um, a part of that map. It won't be the whole map, but it'll be a part of it, maybe. I actually can't wait till she reads it. So she's at a point where she's old enough to read it and yeah, get it yeah. and see what her reaction to your journey has been, because that would be really a fascinating conversation. To have. But can you tell me if that, in your experience, that's ever worked? Because I don't know. Like, it's really exciting to write a book, but do your children read your books very often? You've written seven at this point. How does it go? Do they that, go, Dad, you're cool, but I don't know if I'm going to read your book. That, my friend, is for another show. <laughs> this show is about you. The name of the book is Son of Elsewhere. Yeah. It's a memoir in pieces. It has brought El Amin Abdul Mahmoud to our studio, and it's really a very lovely, lovely story. Thanks, El Amin. Thank you, Steve. Scattered across this province, especially north of the French River, are towns that boomed when the resources they possessed were in high demand. But just as good fortune comes, it can slip away too. And what comes next for such places is the subject of the six-part TVO original documentary series. It's called Crossroads, Beyond Boom and Bust. Jennifer Horvath is the series producer responsible for the program, and she joins us now here in studio. So nice to have you here. Thank you, Steve. And we should tell everybody, you're not related to the former NDP leader. I'm not. Because she's a W and you're a V. That's right. But you pronounce it the same way. Pronounce the same way. Jennifer, we're going to show everybody a little bit of your work and then come back and chat, okay? Fantastic. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll the clip. For almost 50 years, Smith's Falls was proudly known as the chocolate capital of Ontario. Home to 9,000 people and anchored by the giant Hershey's chocolate factory, Smith's Falls was a small town success story where generations earned a good living in manufacturing, and kids who grew up there could stay in Smith's Falls to find jobs and raise their own families. Tourists came by the busload to visit Hershey's and the Rideau Canal. Then, without warning, it all fell apart. Mm-hmm, and doesn't that set up the series to come? What inspired your interest in doing this series? Uh, well, my colleagues at Alibi Entertainment, the production company, had done a previous series for TVO called Northern Gold about the gold rush in Timmins. And that was so successful that we thought we should maybe look into doing spin-off specifically about towns uh, that had been resource dependent. Um, but when we started doing the research, we found there are so many small towns in Ontario um, that have gone through this boom and bust cycle. Uh, not all of them just resources. Sometimes it was like Smith Falls. There was a particular factory that really employed most of the people there. Um, other places, it was more of a, a cultural tradition. So we did a lot of research, uh, put forward a number of locations, and here we are. You have criteria that could really apply to dozens of places, if not hundreds, across on Ontario. How, how do you pick six? It, it was tough, um, and we also wanted to make sure that we were trying to get as wide coverage across the province as we could. So some of it was geographical. We have southwestern Ontario, eastern Ontario, northern Ontario, um, and then a, a couple in kind of the, the southern Ontario region. But we wanted, we wanted places that would each have a unique story, so we really looked for diversity in, in the experience. Well, that is one of the neat things about it. You're not just using natural resources uh, as a boom and bust cycle. I mean, you've got, you've, got a, you've got cultural industries in there as well. That's right, yeah. We have the episode about Stratford, which, of <laughs> course, we, you know, we all know the Stratford Festival, huge source of income for that 
community. And even though this series was greenlit before the pandemic, um, Stratford, I think, was really the pandemic story because they were, of course, hugely impacted when theaters had to shut down. There was life in Stratford before the Stratford Festival. Got to go way back. That's right. Yeah. But what's so interesting about Stratford um, is that originally it was a train town. There were thousands of people who worked in the train sheds there. And when the uh, steam engine industry closed down, they went into a, a bust cycle. And Tom Patterson, who was the person who came up with the idea of the Stratford Festival, grew up in Stratford. He was given an assignment in high school to think of alternative industries for their town. He came up with the idea of the festival in high school, and then it just stuck with him. And later on, when Stratford was really struggling, he went to the city government and said, listen, I really think this is a good idea. He'd been going on about it for quite a while. So they gave him some money to research it, and off he went and created the festival that we have today. It's it's really an incredible story. What a visionary. Yeah. And, and how many millions upon millions of people have gone through that small southwestern Ontario town and seen the best of, of Shakespeare. Um, all right, let's bring some other voices into this conversation as well, now that you've set it up for us, Jennifer. So with all of this background in, pra in place, we'll broaden our conversation with us now in Prince George, British Columbia. Greg Halseth, he is a professor in the geography program at the University of Northern British Columbia and the Canada Research Chair in Rural and Small Town Studies. In Cobalt, Ontario, Sue Nielsen, reporter and photographer with the Temiskaming Speaker. And from Scarborough in the provincial capital, Soheb Shahid, Director of Economic Innovation at the Conference Board of Canada. And we're delighted to welcome you three as well to our discussion tonight. And Sue, let's, uh, let's start with you. I want to find out, first of all, how far your roots in Cobalt, Ontario go back. Oh, my uh, roots go back to 1906 to when my grandfather, uh, Charles Smith, came to Cobalt to uh, search for fame and fortune and, and wealth in the mining, uh, in the mines here. Uh, my grandmother arrived in 1909 and my other set of grandparents, they arrived shortly thereafter, my father's uh, parents. So um, the story of Cobalt is actually our family story. Which, which goes back to 1906. So you say the story of Cobalt, which is essentially what? It's uh, an incredible story of uh, boom and bust. And the boom that captivated uh, the whole of Canada in 1903, we had 100 uh, mines operating. We had about 15 to 20,000 people living here. Um, there were incredible uh, advances in the mining industry uh, originated here. And uh, we had... Um, original CIBC bank uh, here. The first OPP detachment was here. Uh, we can trace our, there's Cobalt Lake. Yes, that's where all the mining activity pretty much took place around Cobalt Lake. You had we, five opera houses in that town once upon a time. Yes, we had five opera houses. We had uh, streetcars. And we had brothels. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have to go into too much detail about that, but maybe you could. No. Maybe you could just tell us. Okay, that was cobalt at its at its best. How would you describe yeah. cobalt today? Well, I I would say we're a ghost town. Um, I, you know, I hear that uh, description, and I wouldn't say we're a ghost town. We're a population roughly of, of about a thousand. We seem to be a bedroom community for Temiskaming Shores, where a lot of people work, and where the the grocery stores and the commerce is, and uh, the the medical facilities. So uh, we seem to have. Um, been a bedroom community over the years. We have lost a few businesses, uh, but um, what's really interesting and encouraging now in Cobalt is we've, we're seeing a mini boost in businesses, small businesses opening here. We've had three businesses open in the last, uh, say, four or five months. We, uh, we're seeing a real estate boom in the area where people from Toronto who are fed up with city life are moving north and the prices of homes up here and properties are, are to their liking, so it's really encouraging, and um, things are happening here. Okay, let me get Greg in at this part of the story, and maybe you could tell us, Greg, uh, how common you think the cobalt experience is in terms of boom and bust cycle. 
Well, change is one of the stories that really runs through non-metropolitan Canada. You know, I'm coming to you today from the traditional territory, the Clayla Tanay, and if there's one thing we know about regions like this, <laughs> change has been something that's an ongoing story. If we look at non-metropolitan Canada since the end of the Second World War, there was that long period of economic boom, the growth of resource industries, migrations to small places, heavy investments by government. But since the 1980s, a lot of transition around globalization, uh, international competition for capital, et cetera. So the pattern of change is really common. It doesn't matter where you go, actually, in developed Western economies, non-metropolitan places are all facing the question of change and pretty dynamic change since the 1980s. And we see that across Canada and, and far more globally. And is the experience that when, let's say, for example, the mine closes, uh, the city mothers and fathers automatically start looking for the next big thing to come in and replace it? Is that what tends to happen? Well, historically, that's uh, that was the pattern. We had people looking for a replacement industry. But really, over the past 40 years, the towns that have been successful have been moving on a much more dynamic track. They have been, first of all, looking at who they are and who they want to be so that they know they have a vision that fits with their aspirations. They've been looking at their natural assets around them, including cultural, social, um, physical, those sorts of things, and thinking about how they can rebundle those in new ways to be competitive in a global economy. Then they invest, as all our communities do, in uh, community development foundations, good services, good quality of life, good amenities, community capacity, build that solid foundation for the future. And then they really work over the long term on diversifying the economy, not bringing in necessarily a new replacement industry because they can come, they can be very successful, and they can also go. They look to diversify and bring more uh, economic actors into, the, into play. Okay, so Heb, I want to uh, explore this further with you in terms of not necessarily the mill closing down or the mine closing down, but COVID closing down a town. As you look across the province and or the country, can you point to smaller towns or villages in this province or country that literally went through a bust crisis because of COVID and haven't come back yet? You know, Steve, you know, whenever there is a boom, uh, there has to be a bust at, at some stage. This could happen due to economic cycles, this could happen due to natural disasters, or this could happen due to a pandemic. Um, and if you look at, you know, uh, if you look at within you know, economics, you see that, uh, you know, booms and busts are, are a natural part of uh, the economic life cycle. You know, whenever there is a boom, uh, you know, there are more jobs, the economy grows, investors make more money. Whenever there's a bust, you know, growth slows down, people lose jobs, and investors also lose money. Uh, what is problematic, though, is when an economy or a small town can't recover from a bust. And symptoms of that are seen in the form of, uh, you know, businesses closing shop, uh, community centers closing down, and people leaving town. And this has been happening for different reasons, and even before the pandemic, for for example, it's been happening due to you know jobs being outsourced to other countries. It's been happening due to new highways being constructed, which are you know diverting economic traffic elsewhere, as in the case of downtown Epony. And it's also happening because the economic landscape is fast changing globally, and some small towns are struggling to keep up. Well, Jennifer, let's pursue Stratford because we talked about that a few moments ago. The assumption is obviously Stratford took a major kicking when COVID came in and they had to close everything down. But COVID is more manageable now. Do we assume Stratford has come back? Well, what's really interesting about Stratford is that they've done exactly what uh, Sahib and was mentioning just in terms of thinking about where they wanted to go. And they did this even before COVID. So Stratford had been pursuing very aggressively a, a policy of becoming a smart city. They really invested in their own infrastructure um, to provide utilities, internet, high-speed internet. Uh, they've become a community where technology companies go to test out their technology. So they've had a pilot project with um, timed traffic lights. They have a place where self-driving vehicles can be tested. Uh, they've been testing like robotic snow clearing sidewalk uh, robots. So even though they took a real hit with COVID, because they had all these other 
um, industries that they had been pursuing, they managed it much better than they would have otherwise. That speaks to the diversification that I was just talking about. Absolutely. So they, they're, they're not all their eggs are in one Shakespearean yeah, basket. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think they had learned from the, you know, learned from the history of what happened when all the uh, train manufacturing shut down there. Thousands of people were out of work. They really didn't want to be dependent on, on a single industry. Right. Shall we take a look at another clip from your yeah, series? Let's do it. Let's do that. Okay. Sheldon, if you would. There's a lot of projects that went so far, collapsed, and a lot of people got hurt. That particular facility, it was started in 93, 94, and had several reincarnations, several bankruptcies. That refinery building has had several kicks at the can before. It's never been very successful. I spent two years there doing the electrical. Turns out it was it was a farce. It, it never panned out to anything. It was a big uh, letdown for everybody, big disappointment. They packed up and left, and nobody got anything out of it, so. We've seen this over the years where companies come here. It's, it's a scheme. They use the name Cobalt. They raise money. They get investors to invest in them because Cobalt has the history, and then they leave. Hmm. We have a rule here. Sue has to be in every show that we do here at TVO. That's. Uh... I, I have to say, I'm so glad to see Sue here today because she has lived through this experience, and hmm. I'd love to hear what she has to say about it. And we will get to her in a second because I, I want to first of all follow up with you on the issue of, I mean, that's cobalt, and and there's a new industry that's come to town in an attempt to kind of. Bring things back. That's, Tell us about that. That's right. I mean, this is sort of the the latest thing that's happening. There is the um, growth of electric vehicles uh, requires lots of batteries. Cobalt is an essential element in the production of batteries for electric vehicles. So currently, uh, First Cobalt is uh, trying to establish a, a facility there to. Um, process cobalt, not necessarily mine it there. They would bring cobalt from other parts of the world and process it there. Um, so this is kind of a, a new idea. They're taking advantage, as uh, these guys pointed out in the clip, taking advantage of a facility that already existed there and trying to build a, a new technology base from from cobalt. So it's a big risk. I mean, it's going to require millions and millions of dollars. They put a lot of money into it so far, but if it's going to grow into what the vision is, it's it's going to be a big investment. Sue, so what do people in cobalt think about this potential new great hope? I mean, it's fantastic. Anytime we can have a, a, a big uh, business, com a company like that come here, it is fantastic. Um, I must say that they're not called First Cobalt anymore. They've dropped the name Cobalt, which is a bit disappointing to me because they used the story of Cobalt and they used our name to uh, attract investors and um, promote the business. And yet they've dropped the name Cobalt, officially dropped the name from the company. But that's OK. Um, I wish them all, all the best of luck. They've, uh, they have $80 million, apparently, in funding for this um, project and they promised 45 high paying jobs, which 45 jobs might not sound like a lot in Toronto or other places, but up here, it will make a huge difference economically to this region. And we hope that uh, some of those jobs go to cobalt, uh, to go to cobalters uh, and that uh, cobalt um, benefits in some way from this, this project because it was sold uh, on the auspices of the cobalt uh, story. Right. Let's put that in perspective. Uh, so, uh, you're right. 45 jobs in Toronto would not make the newspaper. But what's the population yeah. there? 1,000, 1,200, something like that? Yeah, 1,000, roughly 1,000 in cobalt and let's say 10,000 in Temiskaming Shores, where the mm. facility is actually located. It's not located in cobalt. It never was. It's located in Temiskaming mm. Shores. So Temiskaming Shores is going to get that business tax revenue. And that is going to make the region prosper as well. Um, so, you know, what's good for Temiskaming Shores is often good for cobalt. Um, we, um, you know, we've seen this over the years. Uh, big business has, have come to the region and um, used the name of cobalt and used the cobalt story to attract investors. And 
all we ask for is wash the feet of the poor. And what I mean by that is um, there are lots of organizations, food banks, uh, service clubs, museums that, that need funding, that need help. And we just ask these corporations to be good corporate citizens uh, when you come here and wash the feet of the poor. Uh, I'd like to credit Ag and Eco Eagle Mines for what they've done in Cobalt and what they're doing in Cobalt. They've really been a good corporate citizen. They are a role model for what they, they've been an excellent friend to Cobalt and they continue to to um, give money to the town. They've given a million and a half dollars to uh, create a Cobalt Legacy Fund which benefits the not-for-profit organizations, the museums, the library here in Cobalt. And they've also done a lot of rehabilitation work with the old mine sites to make it safer to live in this region. So uh, if you're looking for, for a good corporate um, uh, company, Ag and Eco Eagle is our friend, and Tech Cominco as well. Okay, thanks for putting that on the record. Greg, let me get you to follow up on that in, in as much as if you're in a boom-bust cycle and a big industry comes to town and says, we're going to put some dollars here, the, the town very, can't very well say no, can they? Well, communities have to make choices about their own futures as well. They're active players in these discussions. As I mentioned, getting a sense of your assets, your aspirations, who you want to be is a critical piece to this. Investing in your community development foundation is a critical piece to this. Once you do that, you can make choices. I can share with you the story. I think it's a very telling story of a successful community in northern BC. It was built as a coal mining town. The coal mines closed. It was, of course, a tremendous challenge. The community worked very hard to diversify their economy. And then, of course, coal prices changed, so new coal mines were opening. And the mayor, when he went to open one of the new coal mines, cut the ribbon and said, you know, we're welcoming this coal mine back. Great to have you back. We know how to do coal mining here. But make no mistake, we're not going back to being a one industry town. We're going to stay the course on economic diversification. And over time, coal mines have come, coal mines have gone. They close with increasing rapidity because of that faster pace of the global economy. And yet the diversification activities have been very successful. There's a suite of about a half a dozen or more economic activities in that community that all carry it through those economic cycles. So this is the, this is the lesson and the pattern for places. There may be opportunities that come Communities have to make the choice. Will they follow through on that opportunity? And if they do, they have to make sure that they maintain their course on economic diversification. It's a long and difficult challenge, but 20 years of attention to economic diversification we've seen in community after community after community can build a broad and robust foundation. Going back to the the number of jobs that are coming, it's not just the 40 or 45 jobs in a particular economic activity. It's the spin-off benefits that come from that. You have the people who are then hired to educate the children of those workers. You have the police officers uh, that then are able to be funded. You have the fire fighters who are then able to be funded. You have the retail stores that now have a few more customers. These are the benefits of that and why you want to stay on a diversified pathway rather than simply putting uh, all the stock into one player. The last piece that's really important is that that was a it was a cluster of communities talking about a region and it really is about regional health in these small settings. Maybe so you could follow up on that in this regard. Uh, I, I would assume there are some, you know, town mothers and fathers and political leadership who are watching this right now who are thinking to themselves, when the big industry comes to town, we need to have our ducks in a line and we need to ask the right questions to make sure that this turns into a positive experience and not just a repeat of the same old cycle. So what kinds of questions should they be asking? Steve, it really goes back to, you know, some of the basics of, you know, what it constitutes uh, a good economic revitalization. And I think uh, the centerpiece of which is, you know, diversification. Uh, and when I say diversification, I don't, I don't just mean product diversification or industry diversification, but I also mean diversification of the labor force. I also mean the diversification of ideas and diversification of, you know, welcoming people of different cultures and backgrounds. Um, 
The other thing I'll say is that I think they also, you know, the community also needs to be mindful and work together with the, with the private sector and public sector to create awareness of the town, uh, to promote its, promote its livability, not just in Canada, but also abroad. And to mention, you know, what it has to offer, for example, compared to the GTA, and uh, an obvious one is, you know, the lower cost of living. Uh, and the final thing I say is that, you know, incentives always work. Um, you know, people respond to incentives. A good example that comes to mind is the uh, Northern Ontario uh, School of Medicine. Uh, you know, in, it, in its efforts to recruit physicians to the area, uh, you know, has offered free tuition. Uh, in in return for uh, you know you know physicians you know, offering their services in northern communities, so it's a combination of these factors that need to be looked at before uh, you know any community says yes to any proposal. Just that you mentioned head office. Uh, out of curiosity, where's your head office? Uh, you know, we are a virtual organization, uh, Steve. Uh, we were based in Ottawa. I'm I myself in uh, in Toronto, but we have colleagues across uh, the, the country. So the the notion of a you know bricks and mortar headquarters where it all sort of happens, those days are gone. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, you know, for example, Steve. Recently, a lot of countries what they've done is that they have uh, started what they what is called digital nomad visas. You know, Germany has done this, Spain has done this, and I think this is something we should look into because what this allows a country to do is that it. Um, you know, we can have a foreign citizen come and live in Canada without working for a Canadian company. They can work for themselves or for a company that is back in their home country. Um, we do have some programs that allow for remote work uh, for immigrants. Uh, and I think that is something we can lean into more. Because even though, uh, you know, if we do something like something like this, you know, we can have someone work, uh, we can have someone live in some of these communities without working for a local business while at the same time benefiting from the lower cost of living and playing their role as consumers in the community, investors in the community, and also, you know, creating, uh, you, know, uh, you know, acting as an ambassador for the community when they go back hmm. to their own home country or hometown. Is that to say, Jennifer, that, um, that this opens up a whole bunch of new possibilities in terms of the cobalts of the world? Um, you know, uh, absolutely, and, does. and that was something that we really saw across uh, the communities that we filmed in, where you know there were people who have obviously lived there for generations who are, have been working very hard to keep the lights on, um, but they were also really welcoming and looking for new residents to to move in, and the whole. Uh, pandemic experience of being able to work from home has really changed a lot of people's minds about what kind of community they want to live in. And so a, a number of the places that we filmed in, we're seeing a growth, um, as Sue mentioned, of people who were like, we don't want to live in a big city anymore. And all of a sudden, it's a possibility for us to live in a smaller community. So Sue, as you start thinking about possibilities, if it's not first cobalt, or as it's now known, Electra, if it's not them, what then? Small business interests. Um, we've seen uh, a lot of small businesses start up. Um, maybe they don't have 100 employees, but they have five or 10 employees. But I think one thing that's really important that I must emphasize here is that in order for the North to prosper and the region to prosper, we need reliable high-speed internet and cell phone access to attract businesses. And right now, we don't have it. We were made aware of it through the pandemic, how um, we really need um, reliable uh, internet and, high, and telephone access. And governments have, the federal and provincial government has committed to funding projects, but it's slow in coming and uh, it needs to be broader based and we need that quickly. And we need the North to have high speed internet access and telephone service. And we also need a strategic plan uh, we need uh, communities uh, along the Highway 11 corridor, for instance, here, to come together and instead of working in silos, to come together to create strategic plans like uh, it was mentioned, to attract uh, people from not only the city but international people to come here. And I believe attracting immigrants is going to be a huge game changer for this region. Uh, we saw it. it, it could almost come full circle because people from the four corners of the world came here at the turn of the century to mine. 
Italians, Poles, Finns, Scots, and they brought a diversity with them. And that, I think, is, is how we have survived through the years. Our strength is diversity and resilience. And I, I really believe that bringing immigrant um, populations here is going to be a game changer. And I believe that this region is at a crossroads, an important crossroads right now. And we have a, a lot of um, opportunities to prosper and, and boom. And boom, instead of bust, that would be a nice boom thing. Boom, instead of bust. Right on. Yeah. Well, Greg, maybe uh, maybe you could follow up in this regard. Do you think governments are adequately seized of the idea that Sue just mentioned, that, that none of this is possible without access to broadband in a major way? Do people get that now? Well, people get that, but there's three <clears throat> pretty significant failings on the part of uh, provincial governments and the federal government. The first is we don't have a 21st century vision for non-metropolitan Canada. Time and time again, I see provinces move forward in 1950s and 1960s vision of mobilizing for resource extraction only. The second is we're not seeing a coordinated investment strategy. Just imagine in metropolitan Toronto, the amount of investment that's been needed to make that a 21st century fabulous city. And then look at all of our small places that have not had that kind of investment. Uh, they touched upon broadband and those kinds of things, but you can't drive along these corridors without uh, having your cell phone reception drop out. The key safety device most people travel with now doesn't work across most of those things. And the last thing governments are really missing out on is that when they do initiatives to be of assistance to non-metropolitan Canada, they do it through a singular department or a singular initiative, some sort of silver or magic bullet solution. When we created this non-metropolitan landscape in the post-Second World War period, it was a whole of government initiative. We reshaped healthcare, we reshaped education, we reshaped transportation, communication, economic development, finance, local government. And we're not doing that now. We haven't fundamentally got a new vision. We're not investing, and we don't have a whole of government approach. Those are pretty significant challenges. But the states that are doing it have leapfrogged ahead of Canada in terms of non-metropolitan government, and we've got to stay competitive. Yeah. And you have put the word forward. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight on TVO and remind everybody that Crossroads Beyond Boom and Bust is Jennifer Horvath's latest contribution to this network. Uh, it was on earlier this evening, and we look forward to the uh, ensuing five episodes. Thank you so much. Jennifer, thank you very much. And Sue, Greg, and Sahad, thanks so much for joining us as well. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good. Have a great week. And that is the agenda for Monday, June 13th, 2022. Tomorrow, can good policy make social media work better for Canadians? We'll consider that. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, read Steve Pagan's articles, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.